My first summer in the Sierra by John Muir. July twelfth, the dawn has returned, and again we go on pilgrimage. Looking over the Yosemite Creek country, he said, from the tops of the hills, you see nothing but rocks and patches of trees. But when you go down into the rocky desert, you find no end of small grassy banks and meadows, and so. The country is not half so lean as it looks. There we will go and stay until the snow is melted from the upper country. I was glad to hear that the high snow made a stay in the Yosemite region necessary, for I am anxious to see as much of it as possible. What fine times I shall have, sketching, studying plants and rocks. And scrambling about the brink of the great valley alone, out of sight and sound of camp. We saw another party of Yosemite tourists today. Somehow, most of these travelers seem to care but little for the glorious objects about them, though enough to spend time and money and endure long rides to see the famous valley. And when they are fairly within the mighty walls of the temple, and hear the psalms of the falls, they will forget themselves and become devout. Blessed, indeed, should be every pilgrim in these holy mountains. We moved slowly eastward along the Mono Trail, and early in the afternoon, unpacked and camped on the bank of Cascade Creek. The Mono Trail crosses the range by the Bloody Canyon Pass, the gold mines near the north end of Mono Lake. These mines were reported to be rich when first discovered, and a grand rush took place, making a trail necessary. A few small bridges were built over streams where fording was not practicable, on account of the softness of the bottom. Sections of fallen trees cut out, and lanes made through thickets wide enough to allow the passage of bulky packs. But over the greater part of the way, scarce a stone or shovelful of earth has been moved. The woods we pass through are composed almost wholly of Abies magnifica, the companion species. Concola, being mostly left behind on account of altitude, while the increasing elevation seems grateful to the charming Magnifica. No words can do any anything like justice to this noble tree. At one place, many had fallen during some heavy windstorm, owing to the loose, sandy character of the soil. Which offered no secure anchorage. The soil is mostly decomposed and disintegrated moraine material. The sheep are lying down on a bare rocky spot, such as they like, chewing the cud in grassy peace. Cooking is going on, appetites growing keener every day. No lowlander can appreciate the mountain appetite. And the facility with which heavy food called grub is disposed of, eating, walking, resting, seem alike delightful, and one feels inclined to shout lustily on rising in the morning, like a crowing cock. Sleep and digestion as clear as the air, fine spicy plush bows. For bedding, we shall have tonight, and a glorious lullaby from this cascading creek. Never was stream more fittingly named, for as far as I have traced it, above and below our camp, it is one continuous bouncing, dancing, white bloom of cascades, and at the very last, unwearied, it finishes its wild course. In a grand leap of three hundred feet or more, 
to the bottom of the main Yosemite Canyon near the fall of Tamarack Creek, a few miles below the foot of the valley. These falls most rival some of the far-famed Yosemite Falls. Never shall I forget these glad cascade songs. The low booming, the roaring, the keen, silvery clashing of the cool water rushing exulting from form to form beneath irised spray, or in the deep, still night, seen white in the darkness, and its multitude of voices sounding still more impressively sublime. Here I find the little water wuzao, as much at home as any linnet in a leafy grove seeming to take the greater delight the more boisterous the stream the dizzy precipice the swift dashing energy displayed and the thunder tones of the sheer force are all inspiring but there is nothing awful about this little bird its song is sweet and low and all its gestures as it flits about amid the loud uproar bespeak strength and peace and joy contemplating these darlings of nature coming forth from spray sprinkled nests on the brink of savage streams samson's riddle comes to mind out of the strong comes forth sweetness a yet finer bloom is this little bird than the foam bells in eddying pools. Gentle bird, a precious message you bring me. We may miss the meaning of the torrent, but thy sweet voice, only love is in it.